So, um, my name is Jen Mitchell, and I am the team leader for um, the UAT team at Utah Schools for the Deaf and Blind. And um, so today we're going to be talking about um, some of the assistive technology that, um, that our team uses for our students who, um, who are blind, have low vision, deaf, hard of hearing, and deaf blind. So um, we're going to provide um, examples using the consideration support document um, and show you some of the assistive technology that um, is most commonly used at our school. Sorry, okay, there we go. Okay, so um, we'll go over the consideration support document in more detail, but um, the areas that we'll be covering is academics, sensory, communication, physical access, and computer access. And then we're also gonna talk about the resources um, that we have through our school that's available statewide. So AT and the law. So according to IDEA, assistive technology is any item, piece of equipment, product system, whether acquired commercially, off the shelf, modified, or customized that is used to increase, maintain, or improve the functional capabilities of children with disabilities. So IDEA has deliberately left this definition broad and it's up to the, um, so that the IEP teams um, have discretion on how to use it. Uh, the only devices or tools that are specifically excluded under this are surgically implanted ones such as cochlear implants. So IEP teams are required to consider assistive technology for every student on an IEP. Um, this includes consideration in the general education setting, the special education setting, related services, and extracurricular activities. So right here is, um, this is a copy of the consideration support document. And um, this document has helped us and our team um, communicate what we do as the UAT team with our, our teachers, our paraprofessionals, and our administration. And it shows the five areas that assistive technology can support. Um, often assistive technology can be overlooked in some areas. A lot of times we'll get referrals and um, most of them are just for communication or, or switches or kind of narrow in one area, but this, um, this document just helps us educate others on all the areas that are available that assistive technology can support. Um, this, this document here is kind of how, how it came out from um, USBE, that's the layout of it. But if the, in the handouts that you guys have, um, there's a link, and this link takes you to um, an accessible version of the document. You can use screen readers, but the, um, um, the accessible version is screen reader friendly, and it gives more detail about, um, about that form. So um, let's see. So this form was originally um, um, Payson Unified School District out of Arizona are the ones who came up with this form that listed the five areas of assistive technology. And then Utah, um, the school board has adopted it. And so it's something that we use throughout the state. So if you're on a UAT team, you're probably really familiar with this form, but if you're not, it, it might be something that's new to you. So the, um, the areas that it covers, it just kind of helps you go through a checklist of all the areas to make sure that you've considered um, all of the areas um, that we can provide assistive technology for. So this list lists um, specifically some assistive technology, but it's not meant to be used as a shopping list. We, we don't want to go through it and, and think this looks good, this looks good, that we can just have um, try some of all of the things, but we need to make sure that it's linked to the IEP goals and that we're going through the right process, that we're assessing the student um, and then choosing the assistive technology to help meet their goals. So the first area um, on this document is academics. And under academics, there's reading, written expression, math, and um, executive functioning and learning. So I've just briefly listed out some of the things um, that we provide for, for our students at our school. So under reading, we have digital book players, um, online library services, such as Bookshare, Bard, and Sora. 
um, use of picture symbols with text, electronic books, screen readers, smart reading technology. There's OrCam devices um, that's OrCam devices or MyEye, which are um, smart readers. And then for written expression, there's word prediction software, speech to text software, alternative writing programs, graphic organizers, slant boards, pencil grips. Those are just some examples under that area. For math, we have abacus calculators that are talking calculators, large print calculators, others um, like the screen display options, um, symbols and manipulatives, and um, executive function, um, smart, smart pens, electronic reminders, print or picture schedules. And print and picture schedules, um, anticipation calendar systems, those are something that we use a lot with our students in our campus programs. So um, Laura Lee now is going to just talk about um, some anticipation calendar systems and how they look within our schools and show you that some ways that they can be used. OK, so I'm just going to uh, kind of describe um, what these pictures are showing here. Um, so anticipation systems and calendaring systems, you might hear those terms kind of interchangeably. Um, for the sake of our presentation today, we will be talking mostly about anticipation systems, but a calendaring system does build anticipation for that student. So on the top um, left, we have the most simple, very basic, um, this is what we're working on, and then the next basket is now. Um, so for the student that you're working with, depending on whatever cue that they're using, an object cue, tactile cue, picture cue, um, we'll give some examples of what those look like. Um, you'll put that in the red um, basket, and that's what the one that they're working on. So when they're working on that current activity, it's a good idea to kind of reference back to it, show them um, the cue at the beginning of the activity, somewhere in the middle, maybe a couple times, repetition's always good, and then at the end, you're going to move that cue to the finish basket. And that's to let them know that that task is now ended and you're moving to the next task. Um, something I did want to point out about the baskets is they're both very different. The material is different, the shape is different, the texture is different. Um, depending on the vision of this student, they can see the color is very different from each other. So you want to make sure that there's something that this is my active, this is my finished, and there's a distinct recognition in both of those. Below that, on the left-hand side still, again, um, we've advanced a little bit. This student has anticipated and kind of has the um, attention span and cognitive ability to kind of build on that activity. So you can see that, again, all of these are on blackboards. Um, this is just helpful for students with low vision um, to add that contrast, but there's never a student who is impeded by high contrast. It can help many, many students without that vision loss. Um, this example is using object cues. So this is taking the actual object of what it is that they're doing. So making sure that whatever it is that you choose for that activity is something that they interact with. Um, it, the cereal is breakfast. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the next one is, but it's a piece of fabric. So that can be laying down time, that can be resting, um, some kind of activity that uses those. And it is on a slant board, again, just to kind of help with that vision. Um, you're not gonna have as much glare. The pictures on the right are much more complex. We're now moving from um, concrete to a little bit more abstract. Um, you can see that this picture is using or I'm sorry, well, the picture is showing picture cues um, on a calendaring system that was built. This particular student is working on three activities at the time. And the colored boxes in the background are showing the weekly tasks. So for Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, all of the pictures and all of the events that happened during that day are housed right there. So that the whoever's working with the student can take for Monday all of those pictures out and he knows these are all the things that I'm gonna have happen in the day, but they might not be ready to have all of them presented at the same time. Oh, oh sorry, I was impatient. Okay, um, this is our video. Um, unfortunately, we can't show them to you. They don't seem to be working. 
technology. So I'm just going to describe to you kind of what this um, video was about um, to give you an idea of the example that we are we're intending to show. So this student um, is using the counter system on the first slide that you saw before. Um, and he has um, all of the pictures on the back are what's going to happen. And that's where they go at the end. When he's finished with the task, it goes to the back of the board. So kind of out of sight, out of mind. And then on the front of the board is all of the tasks that he's working on currently. So like three or four for that period. Um, this video shows the student there. Um, he's very into PE. He's got a lot of energy, really wanting to go to that. And the, his aide who was working with him was trying to say, okay, it's time for work. And he flipped the board and said, PE. And she said, wait, we're going to do that. Um, and this video shows a really great interaction between the aide and a student, and she's allowing him time to process that and allowing him enough space to kind of think, okay, I want to do this now, but I know I have to work on this task first, and then I get to have PE next. Um, and the second video, he just comes back to it. He threw something in the garbage can, was out of his seat, came back, saw his calendar system next to him, and kind of flipped and like, okay. And then he self kind of regulated and told himself, I need to wait. It's not ready for this. And this is a really awesome example on how calendaring systems and anticipation systems are successful and allowing our students time, whereas before that might have been a situation where he his behaviors are running away. So he would have run out of the class, probably would have found him in the gym um, had you let him get all the way. So I'm sorry, you guys can't see that. <laughs> so when um, thinking about building um, an anticipation system for your students, um, you're going to want to think about their vision, their hearing, their cognitive ability, and where they're at with communication. Um, here are some examples of our visual and tactile anticipation system cues. So. Um, for the hierarchy, you start with the most concrete. You guys know your students and kind of, um, if you're not as familiar, asking the team or kind of just getting to know them a little bit, but starting at that more concrete stage. The object is something that they actually participate with during that time. So we chose a fork and a spoon for our examples. This would be a great time for um, or a cue for a lunch activity or snack activities. But if the student is tube fed, this wouldn't necessarily be the most appropriate key system for them. Um, maybe the feeding tube or something else that they interact with. So you're gonna wanna take into consideration what they experience throughout that activity. Um, miniatures are super cute. <laughs> and I always get really excited when I find a little bus or a toilet. But if that's not what the student interacts with, which if we think about a mini bus, none of our students are going and touching the whole entire bus. For them, the bus experience might be a seatbelt or a buckle or maybe a part of their wheelchair that they're touching. Um, so try to stay away from those miniatures. Um, and then moving to more abstract. So you're gonna move to on the object cues, the um, symbol of it, it's a plastic fork, very similar, not the one he uses, during the activity, but you're getting closer to that ab abstract, which is what you want. You cut it down and then you move it to the braille word or the spoken word. And on the other side, we have an example of the pictures, um, an actual picture and then a drawn picture. With whatever system you use, you want to stay consistent. Um, try to veer from using object cues and picture cues. Um, although that's an ideal golden rule. And for our students who have visual uh, hearing, I've been told to kind of speed up. So um, FM systems are a great use for our students in our classroom. A lot of FM systems now can connect directly to their hearing aids or the cochlear implants. They can also connect to iPads and iPhones. Um, and just something software that we use for our students to YouTube is really popular. There's lots of information that they can glean with signed videos and they can also upload their own. The next ones that we have are Nearpod and Quizlet. Those are good because they're very visual. Um, Nearpod, you can kind of edit in real time as you're going through your lesson and finding that you need to make some adjustments. You can do that then. Um, and then 
IXL Math, which some of you might be very familiar with, some of you may not, um, but we're going to move to the next slide and talk about alarms and alerting devices. So these are just um, oops, these are just some things that are listed that um, just pull that up really quick. Just some more assistive technology that can be used for our deaf and hard of hearing population, extra alert, um, loud alarms, smoke and fire and carbon monoxide detectors, doorbell signalers, phone signalers, baby cry signalers, um, weather alerts. Um, those are just common things that are used within that population. And then um, just for more resources or the support center for, is the Division of Services for Deaf and Hard of Hearing. There's, there's a link to them. These, the, this assistive technology isn't something that we usually provide or recommend in the school set, setting, but oftentimes, you know, our teachers will teach our kids and families about the resources that are available for them. So then um, moving on to um, our blind and low vision population. Um, so vision loss is, is a continuum of from blind all the way to low vision, and the needs of each child are really specific. So it's really important that assistive technology evaluations are done so that the, the, the appropriate um, equipment uh, um, is recommended. So some of the things that we, um, we utilize often is just the Windows accessibility features or the ease of access centers where we can enlarge the cursors, change colors, backgrounds, fonts. Um, visual highlighting or magnifiers, it's just built within the system. Um, braille and large print, braille note takers or braille displays like braille um, refreshable keyboards. Um, apps for the blind, some apps that they use a lot is Seeing AI and that one's on Apple devices. And then Outlook, um, or sorry, Lookout is on Android devices. And those, those programs have facial recognition, they have money identification, and then they have smart readers so they can read menus. And even now, instead of like it reading the entire menu from like top to bottom, you can just have it read just the entrees that are just chicken or just the dessert section. So they're smart readers and they've really, um, they've really evolved and they're really useful. And then another area of uh, vision loss that we probably most commonly see at our school is um, cerebral visual impairment, or CVI. So the diagnosis of CVI is, um, it's indicated when there's an abnormal visual response that cannot be attributed to the eyes. So it's caused by damages to parts of the brain back in the occipital lobe um, that processes visual information from the pathways from the back of the, the brain to the eyes. So unlike uh, many causes of vision loss, CVI is a condition that can improve due to um, neuroplasticity in our brain, our brain's ability to change and rewire. Um, so, so there is um, strategies to help improve vision, whereas some of the other visual conditions, the, the strategies are to compensate for them. So according to the National Eye Institute, CVI is the leading cause of vision loss among kids in the United States. So CVI is, um, there is a, a test that you can do. Um, it's called the Christine Roman Lansky Rating Scale. And so CVI is rated on a scale from zero to 10. And zero means there's no functional vision, they're not using their vision. And then 10 means all of the CVI characteristics have resolved. So on every, um, every level from zero to 10, there's different visual characteristics that you'll see most commonly. And then within that scale of zero to 10, um, she's got it broken down into three phases. So um, phase one is just building visual behavior. So um, our UAT team works with um, the teachers and the paraprofessionals a lot on helping with um, positioning, um, accommodations of materials and um, like teaching strategies and just staff support to help them provide, like set up the environment and provide the right um, instructional materials. So some of them might include high contrast, uh, reducing visual complexity, um, things displayed on a black or a backlit background, 
um, highlighting with a flashlight or movement or reflection, all of those things will help draw visual attention. Um, they often have a preferred color, maybe only one or two colors at this phase, and that they can only see things that are a solid color. So we're not presenting things with a multicolored. And then their visual field, often um, they are using peripheral vision, either off to the side or sometimes way up high. Um, so we wanna identify the visual field, um, help them use their vision within that visual field. And then we wanna start um, moving that peripheral into more of a more of a central vision um, is kind of the progression of that. Um, we always want to consider like the background of um, what's immediate to them and then also the background of their environment and reduce the complexity. And even the clothing that we wear is really important when we're communicating with, with these kids and we're talking to them and we're showing them things. And if we're wearing um, clothing with a bright or a busy pattern, Faces are really complex and hard to see, so that's just a lot of visual clutter that they're not able to really process and um, like um, tune that out and be able to pay attention visually to what it is that you're presenting to them or what you want them to look at. Um, so all of those things need to be um, considered. So in um, and then in phase one, two, we, you really want to use one sensory channel at a time. Like if you want them to see something, you might want to eliminate all other sensory channels, like, like not YouTube videos, that's music and vision together. You might just want the vision. You might want them just to look, or you might want them just to listen because processing all of that at the same time is too much. Um, so when we start getting into phase two, which is integrating vision with function, then you can start integrating another sensory channel because oftentimes they're able to handle that. Um, also in phase two, the, the video that we show here is just a student that's playing with some fiber optic lights and she's looking and she's just batting and exploring and playing with them. But another um, CVI characteristic is look and reach are two separate functions. So sometimes they will look at an object and then when they go to reach for it, they will look away and then reach while they're looking away. And as they get into this phase, that's where it starts to come together where their visual motor skills, they can look at it and maintain the visual attention on it while they're reaching. So that was the video example um, here. Um, but we still need a lot of visual accommodations to help them see and process what they're seeing. So, um, you can start to increase the sensory and visual complexity simul <clears throat> simultaneously in the background. Um, you probably want to continue using backlit devices for um, 2D materials. So in phase one, they probably can't really see 2D materials. It's got to be more of a tangible object. Um, now you can use 2D materials here. Um, don't ex expect sustained visual attention on 2D symbols, so they might you know, glance at it, but they're not gonna be able to hold their gaze on that for very long. Um, and you're gonna see visual fatigue after a lot of vision activities. They won't be able to stay. If you start to see them look away, um, sometimes they just need to look away and take a break and then they can come back to it. But you kind of want to watch for that fatigue too. Um, in the late, late part of phase two, um, backlighting will help to extend that visual attention so they can um, stay using their vision longer. Um, you want to continue to use um, the preferred colors and highlight the salient features of what you want them to look at. Um, utilize um, a variety of visual fields. So usually you notice that they have a preference to a visual field, but now hopefully you can get them to, to gaze and glance and start to look in other visual fields or start to bring their vision from the peripheral, whether it's one side or both sides, start to bring it towards the center now and maybe even down um, center of their vision and lower visual fields usually come last. Um, and then um, you can start to increase the presentation distance. So in, in phase one, it's usually just really near distance, like um, you know six to 12 inches in front of them. And now you can start to move things a little bit further back, depending on, you might still need things that are bright colors or solid colors or preferred colors or a little bit of movement. So if something that's bigger, so they can see that further away.
there we go. Okay. So then when you get to phase three, and um, that is refinement of the CVI characteristics. So again, sometimes you still need those same visual strategies to help them with, with their learning, depending on what they're doing. But some of the things you might need to do is, um, you, well, you can increase number of colors on a display now so they can start to see things that are multicolored, more complex. Um, you wanna highlight the salient features of 2D visuals. Um, if there's symbols or pictures or words of the same color, you might want to space them out or separate them. So if you're using like high contrast symbols and two of them have similar, similar features, similar colors, you might want to separate them and not put them side by side because they still may have a hard time discriminating the difference between them. Or if they're starting to work on letters, you really want to separate them with big spaces so they can really see the details and really understand what this letter, what this picture is, and then what the next one is too. Um, at this phase, like the lower visual field still might be difficult. Um, complexity still might be challenging. Um, but they can, again, they can start to um, attend at further distances away, 18 inches and, and beyond. So they're, they're not just looking and visually attending to things in their near space. Jen, can I interrupt for a second? We've got a question. Yeah. Can you, for the second item on this phase three, highlight salient features of 2D visuals. Can you just explain in more detail what that looks like? Yeah, so if they're, um, if they're starting to look at picture symbols then you want to you want to maybe talk about what it is like either visually highlight it or talk about it or have them feel it if there's like sometimes that a tactile component on there um, will give them more information so sometimes like if it's a it's if it's a pictures of family members let's say sometimes you can um, like put a background or a um, highlight a color or use a texture around it um, you just don't want to put that on a page with a lot of other things. You still really need to highlight it. So whatever 2D visuals you're using, whether it's pictures or words or, or symbols or anything, you might still need to kind of highlight it so they know this is the one I'm supposed to look at instead of a, um, like a background and a lot, of, a lot of information or a lot of things presented all at once. Is that clear? I think I was looking for like what what exactly is highlighting and so based on what you said it sounds like you could add a texture to something or maybe take a light and trace around um, like yeah. a target object yeah sometimes we'll just well. use like a red border around it so like if it's a picture we'll just yeah. use like a if red's a good color so we might just put a red border around it sometimes it is like we'll use um, so if the student is in front of me we'll we'll have a light coming and shining onto it so they're looking so it can be it can be light it can be color. Sometimes it's even just movement too. Okay. Just like this is this is the one just to help bring that visual attention to it. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now we're still on sensory, but we're going to move into um, the tactile system. So the video that we had here is just of the student who is using a switch to activate. Um, it's just a, a vibrating pad. Um, this is this is her just. Um, Practicing with that, the switch that she's using has a tactile component. It's got a little bumpy texture so she can really feel it and really help her make the connection between when she hits the switch that something's happening and then the, the vibration is really powerful to help her um, utilize her tactile system to the extent possible so that she can really feel it and really understand um, that she's that she's caused this. Or, um, so tactile materials um, might need to be enhanced um, they, or they, they're needed to enhance the learning experience. So you might need to provide more tactile experience, more tactiles, more things to help them make sense of things that they maybe can't see or, they, or maybe just that they have low vision. So you might need to provide more enhanced tactile experiences. But then a lot of our kids who are blind have um, tactile defensiveness. And so they don't want to touch, but we really need them to touch. So um, the tactile system is really important for our kids that we are, um, are considering this system and we're approaching it carefully because if they're very tactily defensive, we still want them to use their hands, but we need to help them learn to use their hands in a way that they feel safe and they feel in control. So we use hand under hand technique to help guide them towards something. We don't ever take their hand and just put it on something 
we try not just to place things in their hands. We want to present it to the back of their hands so that they know and they have the opportunity to accept it or reject it. So we just want to be really careful. If, if you've ever, you know, somebody said, close your eyes and hold out your hand. That's a, like, you're like, what are you going to do? That's a really scary experience. So um, we just need to be cautious of that as we're like giving things to kids. Um, just one little tidbit that when when you get a lot of tactile information a lot of tactile sensory experiences in your hands that information can stay within your central nervous system for, for up to an hour and a half or the effects of it so if you've if you've done a you know you've had something in your hand that was like a an experience that was scary it was startling i, I didn't like it it was it was wet it was sticky it was yucky i didn't like it that that response that they're feeling is going to stay with them for like an hour and a half um, so we want to just be really aware of how they're processing that information. Um, and then just one, one study showed that 65 to 68% of children with visual or a hearing impairment had sensory processing difficulties and a limited participation in activities. So um, that just shows that considering um, a lot of times we just skip over the sensory stuff and just leave that to the OT. and that's fine, but we want to make sure as assistive technology teams that as they're um, assessing kids that they're considering it and referring to the OT if they're not already on the team because it is an important part of the technology process. And then the last area is just proprioceptive and movement. Oh, I want to go back really quick on the tactile. So the other... Um, the other picture is this little girl she's deaf blind and she's wearing like a haptic belt or a woodger belt and those are belts that um like they're really big now and popular in the gaming world so this belt on her she doesn't see or hear anything so during like circle time and music times they put that on her and she can really feel the vibration of the music and the sounds so it just it's just one way of giving her a little bit more sensory input the, a way that she can participate to the best of her abilities during during these times and she really likes that her mom said she would sometimes have to take her for a drive and just like really crank up like loud music with a ba bass to it and then she found this belt and they can be really expensive though there's there's woodger vests and belts and they can be i think the vests are like four ish hundred dollars or more and this belt was like 179 or something so just something else to consider and then like the proprioceptive and the vestibular system. So just our, our how we're feeling our bodies in space and how we're feeling our bodies move, um, again, is just another area that we wanna consider um, related to um, assistive technology. So um, weighted vests, weighted blankets, I would recommend you go through your OT and PT um, to make sure that you're using those according to best practice um, methods. Um, specialized seating, um, standing desks, opportunities for movement such as swings, bike rides, wagon rides, tug of war, just things like that where they're really using their body, um, feeling their body and they're able to move. Um, it's really important that they they get that, that, that sensory input, that's nourishment for their brain, helps them grow and develop and um, kind of feel where they're at in space and know their bodies and where their bodies ends in the environment or um, begins. Um, so we want to make sure if, they, if they're not able to give themselves that sensory input um, on their own, that, that we help them provide that. So there's a hierarchy of the central nervous system. And at the very bottom of that hierarchy is all of our sensory needs. And then at the top of that pyramid is the higher cognitive and academic learning. So we just want to make sure that, that all of these sensory systems are vision, hearing, movement, touch, all of that, all of those needs are met um, to the best abilities that we can um, so that they are able and ready to do um, higher cognitive thinking and academic tasks that we're asking them to do. So now we're gonna cover more of the low tech and high tech options in communication. So Laura Lee did a really good job at discussing anticipation and calendar systems. Something that I just wanted to add is these systems are helpful not only for anticipation, but they can give the students more control of their routines. You know, you can start to embed that 
in giving them choices of what they want to do next. Um, and then also using systems such as these, which are eye gaze systems. So in the top picture, there's a picture of all done, which is high contrast and then more. And then there's also a picture in the bottom of a tube, which correlates with the student getting to, um, fed via D-tube or she can also choose from her bottles. So when we're asking this student, we're asking her to gaze at the quadrant um, of if she wants to be fed via G-tube or if she's preferring her bottle that day and she's looking towards it. Um, and then during her feedings, we're giving her opportunities if she wants more or if she's all done. And we're again, just expecting her to look towards it because she has limited motor skills to be able to touch the symbol, um, but she has good visual skills. So we're really using that board to just have her gaze at it. And this is a low tech version. There are more high tech options out there that can be used on um, an iPad or a Toby. Um, ION, there's a lot of higher tech options for eye gaze for more advanced students. Um, the bottom picture just shows another eye gaze board with the symbols more and all done. And there's a mesh screen in the back, which just allows the communication partner to gaze through without distracting the student and see where their eyes are laying. So this can be, you can put anything on these boards um, just to promote communication. And then some more low tech system examples. There's visual system symbols, which most of you are probably familiar with. And then we have the, the more high contrast versions, which are more friendly for individuals with visual impairments. Um, they just highlight the colors that are on a back, black background. Most of these can be found within the symbol sets that you're using. Um, you just have to search for the high contrast. Some of them you have to pay a little bit more for, but for our students that have visual impairments, it's really beneficial for. Um, and then we also have created a symbol system that's tactile with USDB. So within this PowerPoint, there's a link here that you can see all of the options that we've created. Um, and then later we'll talk about a resource that is statewide that we offer where you guys can request these materials for your students that have a TVI or are working with somebody on an IEP that has visual accommodations. Um, and then with this symbol system that we use APH, so they're specific to, um, I cannot think of what APH stands for, but they are specific to visual needs in tactile systems. So we use their specific cards, but all of our symbols have different textures to it. So you can see that want and no look very different. They also feel very different. So these students that use these, we want to use them on students that are able to tactily discriminate, have the sensory input that they need and the motor skill to properly explore the symbols. Yeah. So the question online we have is explain more about the mesh boards. Where do you get them? Um, so most of the time we've made them, um, this one specifically, again, when we talk about another resource that we offer with USDB, this can be requested as a material for your visually impaired student. Um, they're also, you can find them online, but really you can create them with anything. If you're using Velcro, you just want to put felt over any type of board. You can use cardboard, you, anything that's more sturdy. Um, or you can purchase them and they're usually like a thick plastic. So I would just be creative. Um, this one specifically that has the mesh background, we had it made by one of our staff members. Just to share on that point. So I work at a school where we use a lot of these boards and we actually bought like a huge roll of fabric. That's like the car ceiling fabric and we just get it in black and then we wrap it around like old political signs. Yeah, that's and, like, awesome, that's perfect. Yeah, so you can be creative with this. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. I also know as far as symbols go, Project Core on their website, they have um, 3D printable symbols for all 36 of their Project Core symbols and they're made for deaf and blind. So they've got the, you can choose the colors and then they've got the braille and everything. Yeah, and I think something just to consider when using things like that with your more visually impaired students is their ability to just discriminate between those. Often three times 3D materials can feel very similar. Um, we can see the differences and there's differences in the edges and maybe the color, but 
tactile wise, it's it can be hard for our students to really discriminate the, the difference between those. So just being cautious of which symbols you're choosing based on their abilities to discriminate, um, tactically explore um, using their senses and motor skills, and just looking for the best symbol set for that student. It may be more like object cues that are going to be more meaningful than like really abstract things that are, you know, like the 3D printed symbols. But I think that is a great resource as well. Um, and I think that covers that slide. So two systems that we use quite frequently with our students, um, both deaf and blind populations, um, our partner assisted scanning. So a more specific definition of partner assisted scanning is it is an access method in which the communication partner presents choices auditorily and or visually for the child who is unable to use direct selection, such as pointing to pictures with a finger or using spoken language. Um, so the choices are presented and then cycled through for the student to indicate their choice. Um, you want to make sure that you're presenting in the same order so that then they can anticipate when they're going to respond. Um, switching up the order is going to throw them off. So if this is visually or just auditorily, you can, you can use both at the same time, but partner assisted scanning is one that we use often for students to indicate. And their indications may look very different. One may push a button to say, that's the one, or yes, or another student may just smile to show like, oh, I heard the one I want. And then we're you know exchanging it with what we're offering. Um, similar to that is POD, so Pragmatic Organization Dynamic Display Systems. These are generally organized in a book format using symbols and the vocabulary and or a speech generating device. So a more high tech version of that. And these are used for the partner scans through the choices and then the individual indicates which one they're wanting. And then they go split through the book to really narrow down what the student's trying to communicate. Um, I wish we had actually, I think you, Austin, can you click on that one? I, if it will let you where it says example? No. <laughs> OK. Well, the example that I wanted to show is a, a individual who has a specific pod book that is high contrast pictures. And the mom was saying, oh, I don't. did you like that banana? And the, the little girl starts shaking her head. And she's obviously saying no. So the mom then finds the symbol for don't like and was like, oh, I don't think you liked the banana. And the student then like, starts really looking at the symbol and is like nodding. And so it's just a really good communication method just because she's scanning through the pictures, she's modeling what the communication means for the student, and then also giving her the pictures that correlate. So really making that connection for the student. So some medium tech systems, these look very different amongst our students. So. The top one with just the two buttons are called twin talks. So they just have the two options that can be recorded for up to 10 seconds each. Um, something that we start to incorporate with all of ours is a tactile symbol that comes from our symbol list. And that's solely because we want to see if they can develop the motor pattern to be able to use a more complex device in the future. Um, and then, so this one underneath is also this one is called a cheap talk, so it just has the four symbols. You can put a picture on it, you can put the tactile symbol, you can stick an object on there, whatever you want to use, but then that's a voice output device that just gives them more control of their voice. Um, this Go Talk 9 is one that was modified. Um, the idea for this student is that we want to see if they can find the motor planning and really explore the symbols that are on the front face of this in order to then maybe go to a more high tech version that doesn't require the tactile symbols. So really making that connection in his environment and throughout his day with, you know, the symbols such as more during activities of us modeling it, him feeling it, him learning where the placement is, because then we can go to an iPad with a grid on it that allows him to just motor plan and find that symbol in that same spot and continue. Yeah. On the Go Talk, uh, you have a tactile cue. Mm -hmm. So, like, let's say the word want yeah. has those three little squares with the raised um, middle section. 
does the other when you're when you're um, just using the symbol itself without the tactile cue, does it look the same? Like how would they know that want is in that location? It would just be from finding it using the grid so that it's three down, three okay. over. So just learning the motor pattern, kind of like our apps on our phone of the more we find them in the consistent spot, that's what we're really trying to teach the student is that we're not changing the placement of it. That word is always going to be there. Then they're not always relying on the tactile component because really with a GoTalk 9, there are different levels to it. And so this is limiting the student's vocabulary, but with a more advancing the student to a high tech version that shows that they're able to use the motor planning, we can add, add to their vocabulary. Sorry, I have another question. That's okay. Um, so we, uh, so I work at Kari Sue and we've taken a lot of the tactile symbols that you guys use and kind of have built our own symbol set. And I feel like we often have other staff members kind of like look at that bottom left corner for like that's the binder ring and just really want to know how come that's the binder ring and how does the binder ring mean like and so i'm curious how your team responds to staff members or our caregivers who ask that kind of question yeah no that's a great question um honestly i feel like i don't know the right answer for that but i think just saying that these concepts are abstract their core vocabulary really we just want to add the meaning to it like yes it's going to be abstract so are the visual symbols oftentimes and so we just want to make that connection to the student the more we pair the vocabulary with the routine the more we teach them the concept and then make that connection for them so i wish i had a better answer but <laughs> um so Another medium tech option is a prox pad. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this. They come from Logan Tech and they have QR codes on the back of little cards. And this one specifically has a proximity feature and a touch feature. So with a proximity feature, you could put it under a desk and the student would only have to run the card across it um, for it to activate, which is really nice for our students that have you know, limited motor skills. Um, or you can have it be the tap feature where they have to physically put the card on the device for it to use the voice output. Um, again, oftentimes we use like our picture symbols or our tactile symbols on this device. And then they also have another device that is a little bit more high tech, which allows them to combine words. So for this specific one, um, in this example, the student is given partner assisted scanning to find out what the student wants to eat. So he was given options of like goldfish, um, fruit snacks, and something else. And then he was asked again, which one do you want? And when he found, when he heard the one he wanted, he smiled and he was given that symbol to put on his device. So he combined the words, I want goldfish, and then used the green card on the very end to put it together. So then the device said, I want goldfish. So this just allows the students to start to build their vocabulary, build phrases and sentences, um, and then also leading to the more high-tech devices, but sometimes these, this is where the student's at and maybe just carries their symbol sets in their binder or in a binder or just make sure it's trans transfers with a student. Yeah. I've got a student who is using LAMP pretty successfully, but he's losing his hearing and vision. And so we're trying to figure out the reverse, right? Like how to go backwards. Do you have any recommendations for that? Yeah, that's really challenging. I mean, I think with those students, they, they're going to be more reliant on the tactile system. So we have a similar student right now that we're just trying to incorporate more of the tactile components. Um, so kind of, you know, like you said, doing the reverse of incorporating more of those tactile cues, making sure that you're pairing them together, just like you would pair, you know, your object cue with like the picture cue, you want to start to do the other so that then when you're eliminating that device for them, they still have a communication method that they're familiar with. Are you familiar with any tactile overlays for like an iPad that is lamp is on the iPad with an even, yeah, um, you know, and like a grid that could still help? Yeah, and we have um, somebody on our team right now that um, with USDB that is able to create 3D printed overlays. So I would definitely inquire about, you know, meeting with them to have one created for your student. Because um, if they're already familiar with the pattern of that and they still have some accessible hearing or 
things that that's also going to be a resource at the very end. I think we'll have to be really quick with those, but um, I think that can be a great tool for most of you that are asking. And then just quickly, some of the high tech examples. Again, we have eye gaze systems that can be used on different devices as students using an eye on. Um, some of the symbol systems that we use on iPads or we print them out to be a more low tech version are TD Snap, which comes from Toby Dynavox, um, which are the ones in the middle. And then Cough Drop is one that we've really utilized just because of the remote editing features. It's really nice to be able to push words to your students' devices, um, whether that's from the teacher, the speech therapist, whoever is the one in charge of the vocabulary. This allows you to have control in different settings. Um, they're really user-friendly. It's a great device that you can have on multiple platforms. You can have it on your phone. You can have an iPad. Um, it does seem like um, TD Snap is not available on a phone, which can be limiting for some students. So Cough Drop is one that we often utilize. You do, it's $6.99, I believe, a month or $200 for a lifetime subscription. And then whoever is in charge of that account, it's $25 to be like an authorized user. So I don't want to spend too much time because we still have a few more things to go over, but that is our high-tech systems. And Ricky will go over some of the physical access. Okay, so I'm the physical therapist on the team, and usually you don't really see that on a UAT team. So I try to find my place on the team, and positioning is really where I find that I can assist the team. Um, they probably get tired of me saying, but what about positioning? Um, but that's, that's my passion. So um, I'll talk a little bit about physical access, which is on that that sheet, the document that we talk about. So it's something that we address as a team. Um, I'll move through it kind of quickly though, because I want to talk about our resources that we have. Um, so you can try this or not. Um, while I'm talking, um, make a fist and sit on, on your hand and see what that does. Just hang out there for a little bit. Um, so posture and positioning benefits, it helps with um, security and comfort. When you know that you um, are um, positioned correctly and secure in that position, you're able to attend better. Um, it helps with alertness. We have this reticular activating system in our deep brain um, that um, based on our position keeps us alert or makes us more drowsy or sleepy. And that's a deep brain structure um, that we have. Um, so most everyone has access to that. So that's another thing to consider. Um, head control. Um, if you have improved core positioning, you have access to your head control. And then that goes along with visual control and accessibility, um, which is something that I really focus on with our students who are, um, who are blind or have low vision. Um, because if you, if like if you're sitting on your fist right now um, and, and your body's tipped to the side, right? What are you trying to do? You're trying to bring yourself back up the whole time and it's an effort and you're trying to get there. But if you can support the child starting with their pelvis, then trying to control your head is not so difficult and not distracting. Um, and then you can see this child who has um, a collar on his, around his neck as well to help him with that. Um, and then it supports skilled fine motor tasks. Again, just um, conserving energy to maintain your posture. It can be placed elsewhere um, from by motor task um, or other dynamic sitting tasks like balance. Um, so yeah, so as you're sitting there, I, I do this a lot um, when I'm driving the car, I see what my body is doing um, and, and I notice every time I make an adjustment. But if you're a child that's dependent and doesn't have those skills, then you're kind of stuck in that spot a lot of the time. Um, and so that can be really frustrating and distracting. Um, and then places your visual line here. Like if you're lying in bed watching Netflix with your phone, you're, you're tipping your phone to match that, that horizon. The child doesn't have a chance to do that um, because they cannot, they don't have that control. So it's our responsibility to give that to them. I think of um, addressing positioning in three different ways, um, supporting, the or bringing the environment to them um, so that you're moving the environment around to meet where they are um, 
giving them the external support so that they can reach their environment or both of those things um, are kind of the ways that I look at it. Um, so here are examples of me bringing the environment to the student. So these are um, two students who have low vision. Um, you can see their posture and positioning before on the left side, those pictures there. And then just by bringing the computer up to them, you can see how their posture improves, their alertness improves, um, just their access to their academics improves there. And then the student on the far right, he used his vision paired with using the keyboard. So having the keyboard up to his visual line was really beneficial to him. Um, these are videos, um, and I'm sorry, I can't show them, but I'll describe them. Um, here is uh, modifying the student's um, environment and the things around them so they can have access to it. Um, this child on the left just had um, a spinal fusion, so he had rods in his back, and so he um, was not able to move right after surgery. So we placed him on a wedge, um, and then he had access to using his arms. So we placed a toggle switch behind him and the light aid in front of him so that he can scroll through different scenes on the light aid. Um, and very intentionally, he would bring his arm back. And so we're using gravity to assist that as well. Um, so he's not using a lot of effort being in an upright position. It's more comfortable for him to be. Oh, okay. And then um, we have this other student who used a head switch. So that was another way that he was able to communicate is um, by using that head switch. Um, he also had extension patterns that placed him here. So we just moved the switches so he had access to those. Um, he wasn't able to isolate that. And then the student on the right there also used a switch with his foot. He had bilateral extension of his legs. And so um, we placed the switch where he was able to move and he was able to activate switch toys, which he really enjoyed, you can see. Um, other considerations, um, just going through these, you want to consider their cognitive and physical abilities and diagnoses. You don't want to place limitations on a child, but um, just knowing where they're maybe where their prognosis is and where their baseline and potential is. It's really helpful. Um, their, their residual vision and hearing abilities um, and other salient features that are meaningful to them. So um, important vocabulary and just motivation and, and interest that the child has can really give you access to see what their potential is. Um, there's many times where I think a child cannot perform a task and then I give something that's meaningful to them and they're like, oh, yeah, you can do that. Um, so the next slide, we're going to talk about the resources, um, which I really want to get into because I think you guys will enjoy those. So we are at time. Um, I want to just let you know we acknowledge that. So um, if you don't feel like the um, next information is important, it's new, you can leave. Um, if you're so interested, we'll just quickly touch on a few of these themes. Um, these resources are available. Um, they are housed at USDB, um, but they are available to those of you out in the district who have students with those vision and hearing impairments. Um, the ERC is our first one, which is our Educational Resource Center. Um, so it is our library, but I do want to point out it's not just books. Um, we have cause and effect toys. We have some positioning situations. We have mounting. Um, it's a lot of different things, but some things to highlight are um, that are new at our ERC are one-click stories. And so these one-click stories are, um, and all of these will have links that will take you right to the page if you have questions or if you want to know how to access them. Um, the one-click stories will have a phys the physical book with it but we'll also have the component um, of the digital book as well through Google Slides. So you'll QR um, code and it will pull up the story and that way you can kind of um, have it so that the student is hitting the switch to advance the pages. They have the physical, they've got the vision there um, and that has been really successful and enjoyable for a lot of our students. Um, and there's a lot of them that they've done. They spend a lot of time, and so there's a lot of options of different books you can pick one. And then our sensory story kits, these come with, um, again, a story, 
but then we'll have some um, soft animals, some tactile things, maybe some things that smell or hear, um, or the, sorry, sound like what the story is. So if there's a bell on the story, it may come with a bell. Um, they're all related to what the story is talking about. Um, just making it a little bit more sensory and involving. This is our USI Mac Center. So this is where we print in um, large print, braille, or digital formats for um, books. And teachers can use this for their literacy books, their history books, um, even if the English class is reading. Um, I, do they read the Scarlet Letter anymore? Uh, <laughs> if they're reading those, we can um, take that information make it available for the student and however it is that they need a large print or braille and send that out to them. This is fairly new. This is our, we love our abbreviation, so our visually impaired blind assistive technology team. Um, and this is for students who are a little bit higher tech on the visual end. They are needing braille notes. Um, they're using CCT cameras, they're embossers. These are the students that are very proficient um, in Braille and they're much higher tech um, resources that you may need. And again, all of the links are listed so you can go there and they're listed on our uh, slides that should be available to all of you. <coughs> Excuse me. This is also fairly new. This is our Accessible Learning Materials Center. So this is the one that we were talking about that will have the um, iPad overlays. Um, they do, she does have access to a 3D printer, um, but this is um, where you would also go to get the tactile cues that are not 3D printed. The ones that Bray showed with the different cards that have different colors with the different shapes from APH, which is American Printing House. Um, and so this, again, is a service that's available to students in the state of Utah. Do we go outside of Utah? I don't think so. Um, and um, so if your student has a vision specialist or a hearing specialist, um, you can kind of browse their catalog. Um, there's some really good examples of pencil grips. They're, it's really kind of amazing. I'm sure you guys can use your imagination on what you can 3D print, and we probably have done that. <laughs> And that is what we have for today. Um, here are some examples of what the ALMC does. So there's some um, name puzzles, um, calendars. The one at the bottom is just to help kind of separate for students who are learning the Braille, uh, who are learning, learning how to Braille, just to separate the fingers so they can kind of put their hands in place and get that um, motor memory and kind of start to build that. Um, and then on the right side, we have now unfinished boxes. The one in the back, um, when it's done, you actually lift up the lid and it is a magnetized one. So it's pretty sticky, it's not gonna fall, but that's what that is there in the back. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, sorry you got to miss out on our adorable videos. Um, but we really thank you for taking your time and coming to our session today. And we're available here for some questions um, afterwards, if you have any. Thank you so much. And remember to check those emails for the Midas credit and then to also rate all the, all the sessions. And there are a few buttons.